Better Spaces is a health and happiness solution for today's hybrid workplace. My name is Dr. Paul Kachoa, and I partner with them to bring you an easy and educational workday session. Today's session, we're going to be talking about squatting and lunging for knee pain. If you thought that you couldn't squat or lunge because you had knee pain, we're going to try and change that today. Now, a little bit about me. I've been in the PT field for over 25 years. I got my doctorate from Mercy College in uh, Dobbs Ferry, upstate New York. And uh, I got a BS in exercise science from Rutgers University. I'm an orthopedic clinical specialist, um, certified dry needling specialist, certified movement mechanic, whatever you want. But anyway, if you have questions, make sure that you use the chat feature to make this session the best that you can get and make it as informational informational as possible. All right, so let me pull up my uh, slides here and then we're gonna get started. All right, squatting and lunging for knee pain. Now, just like every other class that I've had before, if you've seen me, um, I need to put out this disclaimer. You know, if you're dealing with something specific, you gotta make sure that you get a, a customized assessment and treatment plan to successfully treat all the components and associated issues that are the root cause of your dysfunction. Because this is general information we're gonna go over. And this is, is a targeted at a broad population. So some of the things might work, they've been useful. I've been using these for years, but some might not work for you. So the key thing is as we're going into these movements, we wanna make sure that we're gonna be gentle, cautious, and go slow and go frequent. We wanna make sure that we are doing these things repeatedly throughout the day. You don't have to set aside time to do these exercises. Oh, this is my workout time. I'm going to do this. This is my hour a day. No, you don't have to do that. You can do this at your desk, sitting, standing, on the phone, on a conference call, on Zoom, like we are now, or any time. Because the thing is, like I tell all my patients, if you're coming in to see me, and if you've got long-standing chronic issues like knee pain or, or something, we need, need, you need to make a change, right? And to make that change permanent and make it successful in terms of our treatment, we have to be consistent with what we need to do to change those things. And it's going to be challenging to do them repeatedly throughout the day and as often as possible. But like they say, if it doesn't challenge you, it's not going to change you. All right. Another thing, if you've been to any of my talks and you remember one thing, this is the thing to remember, the body functions on this alternating pattern of stability and mobility. So there's stable segments connected by mobile segments. And if this pattern is disrupted, this alternating pattern is disrupted, pain or injury is the result. So we're looking at the knees, right? So the knees is what we're dealing with today. That needs to be a stable segment. The knee is a very simple joint. All it does is just bend and straighten. It doesn't like to rotate. It does a little, there a, is a little bit of rotation that happens. We're going to talk about that later. But in general, it doesn't like to rotate. It just likes to bend and straighten, right? And then we have the ankle and the hip, which are above and below that joint. And they're mobile. They need to be mobile. Oftentimes, people come to see me with knee pain. They have tight ankles. If you're ankles are limited with their mobility, then the body seeks to try and get that mobility back and compensates for making the knee a mobile segment. So it becomes unstable, it's not a stable segment. So keep in mind this alternating pattern, this is key when we're treating anything musculoskeletal. I love looking at this because if we look at this picture here and we just look at what body parts and what roles they have, if you're looking at one thing where you have pain, you have to look above or below and see, make, make sure that the segments above or below are fulfilling their role, that they're doing their job. If they don't do their job, if they're limited with stability or mobility, then things get reversed and things get kind of bad. All right. So just a little intro or review on the types of stretches, some things that we can go over. Um, we have joint mobilizations and joint mobilizations are typically done with movement. We're trying to improve mobility through a joint. Something as simple as a knee joint, like a hinge joint, the more it moves, the more um, mobile it is, and the more flexible it gets. So there is a, a fluid that is in all joints. It's called, it's called synovial fluid, and it's like the oil of the body. And the way that these joints in the, the joint capsule, the sac that holds the joint together, the way that it produces it or a way that we get it to get produced more is by movement. If we 
don't move a joint, that synovial fluid that's inside that joint can get very viscous, get very thick like molasses. If we move the joint a lot, that, uh, pr it, that increases that synovial fluid production and keeps everything loose and mobile, right? So motion is lotion, I guess, if you think about it that way. So joint mobilizations are done repeatedly through a large range of motion. And we want to do that for at least a minute to two, a minute and a half to two minutes. Um, dynamic stretches are typically stretches that are not held for any length of time, but they are large movements that take you through a full range of motion that give you a little bit of stretch, but they're not held and they're usually done for about a minute to a minute and a half, all right? And they're done prior to activity like sport or at any athletic event. Um, those are designed to warm up the body, um, get that tissue mobile, like the muscles and tendons and ligaments, and get the joints lubricated. Now, the last one, static stretches, are more your classic stretches. Now, these stretches are held for about 30 seconds or up to a minute. 30 seconds is the bare minimum that you can hold any static stretch. If you hold the stretch less than 30 seconds, what happens is that you stretch out that tissue and then it snaps back into a shortened position. So we wanna make a permanent change in the length of that tissue, relax it. So it does take about 30 seconds to make that permanent change. And these are classic stretches that you're like, you know, I'm gonna reach my, into my toe or reach and touch my toes or do a calf stretch or a standing quad stretch. Some of those things we'll go over today but those are held for 30 seconds. So these are the three different types of stretches that we may encounter today. Now, and again, I like to just touch this on this, is that muscle tightness does not equal muscle shortness. I have a lot of people come in to see me that are athletes, they're active, they're saying, hey, you know what? My hamstrings feel really, really tight. And when we test the length of their hamstring, it's within normal limits or it's fine, but they feel tight because the muscle is on. Um, if we look at the hamstring, the hamstring is a muscle in the back part of the leg, right? So it comes from the hip, goes to the back of the knee, it bends the knee, but it helps to extend or straighten the hip. It's not a main hip extender, but it helps. And if the glute muscle, which is the butt muscle, those are the primary power producers of the lower body. If they're weak or inhibited, they don't work very well then the hamstring tends to take up that slack and stays on to hold you up against gravity to replace the job that the glute muscles are supposed to do. So because the muscle is constantly on to hold you up against gravity to give you postural control, that feels tight because it has the inability to relax 100%. So when we get people oftentimes, if they have a tight muscle and it feels tight, but it's not length or it's not shortened, then I'll have them stand and they go and bend and touch their toes. They can't touch their toes, but I have them lie on their back and I just lift their leg up and it goes pretty high. So that is a difference between muscle tightness and muscle shortness. More like we talk about that more. All right, so we're gonna go over some joint mobilizations. We're gonna talk about lunges and squats and a bunch of things. So let's get our two shot up here and let's talk about what we're gonna see today. So anyway, lunges and squats. So first thing, let's just talk about the movement. The movement of a squat, oftentimes people come see me and say, hey, my doctor told me I have osteoarthritis of my knee and I can't squat anymore. What does that mean? If you cannot squat, then I ask them, all right, you don't need to squat, just go ahead and sit down. All right, and I have them sit down. And then I say, stand up. All right, you stand up. That's a squat, all right? The squat doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, feet shoulder width apart, weight on the heels, feet flat, and squatting down to my hips, get below my knees. So this is the classic squat exercise. We call it an air squat, right? It expresses full range of motion of my knee and my ankle. Now, oftentimes, if you have knee pain with that, some simple quick fixes here. We want to make sure that the feet stay flat. If you squat and the heel comes up, if I'm squatting down and my heel comes up, that tells me that you probably have tight ankles. Again, like we said earlier, if the ankle is limited with its mobility, we're gonna put way too much stress on the knee. So the squat has to be foot flat, foot flat, squatting down, all right? So that's step one, step one. The other step is that we wanna make sure that the knees stay tracking where the feet point, all right? So if I'm pointing my feet like 
45 degrees out, which I see a lot of the time. People say, oh, show me your squat. They go out like this. That's the direction that the knees need to go. All right? So then that squat would look like this, really wide. Oftentimes, people don't have that hip mobility. So what I say is the most rotation or turnout of the feet that we can put is probably max 20 degrees. It's just about there. All right. So if you're looking straight at this camera, it's just off center. That's as far as I would want to rotate my feet out. Because if I go to squat, my knees have to go in that direction. The more that my feet turn out, the more I have to push my knees out. If I go 10 degrees off center, that's a little bit easier to track my, my knees over my feet. You can kind of see how they kind of go uh, a little bow-legged. I'm exaggerating the move. We definitely don't want this. All right. If you're squatting and you're getting up out of a chair and your knees buckle in, this is typically due to a lot of hip or glute weakness. All right. The hip muscle, the glute up in here basically takes the knee and the, hip and the, and the leg and rotates it out. Okay. So that's an external rotator, the glute, as well as a extender. It straightens it out. So that external rotation and straightening out is key to protect the knee. So glute strength is important as we're trying to get into a squat position. Now, you're probably saying, Paul, I don't have that amount of range of motion. How can I go into a regular squat if I can't bend that much? All right, I got you. First step is we're gonna work on ankle mobility. I want my ankle to move as much as I can. The more mobile my ankle is, the less stress is gonna be placed on my knee. So what I could start off with, I'll move this towel a bit, is you could put your foot up on a step, on a chair, doesn't matter, and start to, and, and if you have like railings to hold on to, this will make it a lot easier, but we're doing the same principles that we talked about on the squat in a single-legged mobilization for the ankle. I'm gonna keep my foot flat. I'm gonna make sure that my foot is pointed straight ahead and my thigh and knee and hip are all lined up in that same direction. I'm gonna keep my heel down and move my knee forward. All right. So again, if I have something to hold on to, let me just grab this PVC pipe really quick because this will make it a lot easier. So if you're stable, holding on to something, you don't have to worry about balance. And if you do this, this will help to mobilize your ankle as well as the knee. This other leg, you can put it anywhere you want. The big thing is to try and keep this knee moving over the foot. So if I'm going to go face on here in the camera, Here's my foot is pointing straight ahead. As I go forward, my knee and hip are pointing straight ahead in front of that foot. I don't want this, all right, where my knee does go, doesn't match up with my foot. Definitely a no-no. This creates a lot of torque, a lot of rotation in the knee. You don't like that, okay? That's one simple movement with the ankle. Another one is to grab something like an elevated surface, like I have like a, this little block extension off of my bench that keeps the front part of my foot elevated. And that could be as simple as something like a textbook or something like that. It doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be fancy. You just want something to elevate the front part of your foot. You keep the heel down, the heel is gonna stay locked into the floor and I'm gonna bend the knee, the same thing that I had when my foot was on the bench, I'm gonna repeatedly go into that. Like we said earlier, joint mobilizations are repeated motion for a minute and a half to two minutes through a large range of motion as much as you can. Again, optimizing our range, our, our direction of motion. Again, my foot's pointing straight, my, my, my knee, my hip, my thigh are all gonna be pointing in the same direction. So that's two things to kind of work on the ankle, all right? Now, if you're limited with knee range of motion, and especially if you're, if we started out with this and you're like, oh, I don't feel this in my ankle, I feel this in my knee, then we're gonna try a mobilization with movement. Now, this exercise, this intervention was developed by um, uh, Brian Mulligan. He was a uh, New Zealand physical therapist, and he pretty much wrote a lot of the interventions that modern physical therapy uses for mobilizing a joint. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the shin bone. I'm going to take my hands and then put my hands around my calf. The shin bone is going to act like my little handle, right? And as I bring my knee forward, I'm gonna rotate my tibia, the shin bone, inward, okay? So it looks like this, I'm moving forward and I'm coming out. Now, 
whatever discomfort that you feel without the motion in the knee should immediately go away. If you're doing this correctly, it should feel a lot better. Now, I'll show you on the face on view. So the face on view, just move this closer so you get a better look. I'm gonna put my foot up on something. My foot again is straight, my hip, my knee, my thigh are gonna be in the same direction. I grab my shin and I rotate that inward. Now rotating it inward, in this case, the left uh, leg, I'm gonna rotate it clockwise, right? So I'm rotating it inward. But as I rotate it, I don't change my knee direction, right? You could see that it's like a little bit of a mobilization with movement and I don't rotate and pull the knee in. We don't want that, it's not a strong little movement. It's just rotating and then coming in. Got my thumbs around the backside, my fingertips on the shin. I'm just rotating and then going forward. And again, it should feel immediately different, uh, better, hopefully, than when you just do this, okay? Another technique, I've got my towel here, is to do this type of motion in a non-weight-bearing position by gapping the joint. So I'll take my hand towel here, I'm gonna roll this up, and I'm gonna put this behind my knee. So option one, I'm just gonna put that towel space, gap my knee. I'm gonna pull my shin into my calf or my calf to my hamstring, right? I'm pulling my shin in. And this is a way to mobilize the joint. Now, got a lot of range of motion here. So let me uh, double up on this, make the roll a little bit bigger. I'm gonna shove that in the space right there and then create that mobilization, right? So I'm gonna bend it, repeatedly go in here. So joint mobilizations like the previous slide, a minute and a half to two minutes. And I could add rotation in this direction of the shin, just like what we did in the beginning. I could kind of rotate that in, point the toes in, point the toes out, all right? Because the foot is in a non-weight bearing position, this is different, the mechanics of the knee are different than when we did it in a weight bearing position. So it is okay to bend the knee in this direction with the foot kind of pointing in a completely different direction, right? So we can kind of work on that knee. So we're mobilizing that joint. Here's the side view. And I repeatedly do that for a minute and a half to two minutes. That should clear up or improve some of that mobility. Now our test, once we get through those mobilizations, our test is how does our squat look or how does it feel? So our squat, again, shoulder width apart with our feet, maybe 10 to 15 degrees, rotated out toes, and the knees track over that position. Feet stay flat, hands can stay out in front. We see, all right, what does that feel like? Does that feel different? Does that feel easier, all right? So that's the main thing. Whenever we do some type of intervention, some type of mobilization, stretch, whatever, it should feel immediately different. And that is our window of opportunity to create a better movement pattern, absent of movement compensations by repeatedly doing that exercise. That squat that was painful before, we wanna make sure that we groove that motion in, repeatedly doing it, having your brain kind of think, all right, this is where my knee needs to go. This is where my foot needs to go. This is where my hip needs to go because it feels better. It's less pain. We have more mobility than we kind of, um, you know, cement that in our brain on our motor pattern so that we can permanently get rid of any knee issues. So that's the squat. But how about the lunge? So the lunge is, the same thing, it doesn't matter if it's a forward lunge or a backward lunge, the movement that we did with the squat remains the same. If I'm gonna do a backward lunge, which is a lot easier because it engages the hip more, we're gonna take the hip down and back and it turns into a single legged squat, right? So it's basically this position, this knee stays over and pointing where my foot is pointing and I'm just doing this. The forward lunge is a little bit more difficult because we have to transfer weight from one foot to the other. So I have one weight on my left leg and I take that step and I'm transferring weight to the lead leg and then I repeat the process. I'm still doing the lunge. Okay. Now, oftentimes people will ask me, well, if I squat or lunge, is it okay if my knee goes over my toe? I've often heard that my knee doesn't go over the toe line. If I squat and if there was a line from my toe up from the ground, if I squat, the knee should never go in front of that. That's true. But if you have good ankle mobility, that should not be a problem, okay? Getting your knee 
to go in front of your toe really requires that ankle mobility. If you don't have ankle mobility, then yes, I would say as a quick little fix to decrease your knee pain, don't let your knee go in front of your toe. But if you are missing ankle range of motion, that's the first thing you got to get back because physiologically, we should be able to squat with the knees going over the toes through that full range of motion because we have good mobility at the ankle, at the hip, and the knee. All right? So, you know, a couple more exercises. I think I had some knee issues this past week. I was playing a lot of pickleball. My knees were getting a little bit angry. And there was three things that I did to help reduce a lot of that pain. And even before we go forward, people will ask me all the time about like, my, no my knees make so much noise as I bent. I don't know if you, the mic picked it up, but every time that I squatted down, my knees would crackle. It looks, it, it sounds like Rice Krispies. So noise does not necessarily mean that there's a pathological problem with your knee. With, there are a lot of moving surfaces, moving parts in the knee as we bend and straighten. A lot of those things need to slide. That kneecap needs to slide over the femur. So as we age, bony surfaces, cartilage is not smooth anymore. So that can result in degeneration and those surfaces are not smooth. You can't do anything about it. So as long as the noise that happens when you're moving a joint occurs pain-free and without any joint locking, then that's normal, all right? That's a normal joint because it's gonna make noise because we're moving and because those surfaces aren't as smooth as we were, as they once were when we were younger. All right, another exercise. Let's, let's go into these uh, three things. One was just to do toe raise. And I'm gonna lean against the wall here. I've got my hips against the wall. I've got my feet out in front. The more I put my feet out in front, the more aggressive this exercise is. I just keep my knees totally straight and I just do knee raises. And we, I mean, toe raises. And we wanna do this at a high volume. We don't wanna do like 10 and then stop. I wanna do like 15 to 20 or 30 and then do like multiple sets of this throughout the day. All right, as you're doing this, my knees are staying straight. It's not a big move. I'm just lifting the toes up. I feel that burn on my shins. And then that will help improve some of that ankle mobility and take the stress off of your knee. So that's one. The second one is an isometric where I step away, maybe about a foot or two away from the wall. And I put one foot flat on the wall. Hopefully we're not gonna make a mark on this wall with my sneakers. And I push this leg the right leg flat into the wall as hard as I can. And what that does, it forces this leg to work hard, all right? And I can just do a little bit of a knee bend straight. So it doesn't take a lot of motion for me to feel this in my knee and my quad working hard as I'm pushing here, all right? So that's exercise number two. Again, high volume repetitions multiple times a day. The last one that I did that I found that was very helpful for my knee was walking backwards, jumping on my treadmill, about a mile and a half to, to um, you know, 1.6 miles per hour, and just walking backwards, turning around, I could hold onto the railings and walking back. A little bit of an uphill to work those quad muscles, but walking backwards also can help improve your quad strength and reduce the stress onto your knee.